When I say the word B to you, what comes to your mind? B. Does anyone think of hives? What about stings? Raise your hand if you think of honey. Did anyone think of sunflower leaf cutter bee? Mm, I didn't think so. <laughs> well, bee stings, bee hives, golden sweet honey, they all predominantly relate to honeybees. Honeybees, they get all of the attention, all of the press, all of the media. Google honeybee and you get 10.3 million results. Search for sunflower leaf cutter bee and you get 505. Honeybees get all the attention, but you have to know the truth about them. <laughs> Do you like tomatoes, blueberries, cranberries, eggplants? Yes, yes, I, I see a lot of nodding. Good, well, thank bumblebees, more bumblebees, and more bumblebees, right? So bumblebees, they fly onto the flower, fasten their jaws, and then vibrate their wing muscles. This then vibrates the flower and shakes the pollen loose. The honeybees, they don't even know how to buzz pollinate. Now, commercial growers have been using bumblebees in their greenhouses to pollinate tomatoes since late 1980s. Before this, they used vibrating tools. Honeybees, they can't even stand the heat of the greenhouse. Now, delicious watermelons, squash, cucumbers, zucchini, gourds, pumpkins. If you love these fruits and vegetables as much as I do, thank a squash bee. <laughs> so squash bees are largely responsible for the production of all these fruits and vegetables across North America. You see, with these plants, they're, the male and female flowers are on the same vine, but they're too far apart to make baby vegetables on their own. For example, with squash flowers, the female blossoms are closer to the center of the plant and the male blossoms are on the long, skinny stalks. Now, they need a great summer pollinator to get the whole thing working, and that's especially a squash bee's job. These blossoms bloom starting at dawn, and they only stay open for a few hours. This is exactly the same time that a squash bee is available and working. Now, honeybees, on the other hand, they start working later on in the day. So people see them in the flowers, though, and they think that they're doing all the work. But in actuality, they just got there for the photo opportunity, as you can see. So there's so many different bees, wild bees out there. This is a mason bee. Mason bees are wonderful pollinators for early spring crops, such as apples, almonds, strawberries, raspberries, cherries, peaches. And they have these wonderful furry undersides called scopa that carry the pollen really well, right? So they belly flop onto the flowers, actually, and move all around. And by doing that, the pollen falls off of them and then pollinates the flower. They carry pollen so well on their undersides and actually all around them that they kind of look like flying cheese puffs when they're in the air. <laughs> but honeybees, on the other hand, they predominantly carry their pollen on their legs in pollen baskets. They are efficient pollen collectors but not efficient pollinators because the pollen doesn't fall off of them very easily. So honeybees, they actually won't fly when it's cold and drizzly out. These hurt many days in the early spring are really cold and drizzly. The flowers are blooming, no honeybees around. Instead, the wild bees, including the mason bees, are doing all of the pollination work while the honeybees are at home. In fact, honeybees supplement the work of wild bees, not the other way around. Wild bees are two to three times better at pollinating than the honeybees. But pollination services should really not be the only reason why we think bees are cool. They're just cool on their own. They're so beautiful and just so interesting. Like, this is a leafcutter bee. Leafcutter bees 
will cut circles out of leaves. And all these are in the Northeast. I mean, it's so cool. So this is a leaf cutter bee. They cut circles out of leaves to line their nests with it. And then they, they uh, lay their egg inside that. And they also have furry undersides, just like the mason bee. And sweat bees. This is actually a male sweat bee. They're so unbelievably gorgeous. I mean, aren't you guys amazed? Don't you really think that he really is, is beautiful? And I mean, how can you feel lonely when you have all these bees flying around? And then mining bees. These range in length from a quarter inch to three quarters of an inch. I'm sure all of you have seen them in a flower and not even have realized that it's a bee. And then, of course, carpenter bees, right? They drill holes and pieces of wood because they need to make a nest, but they are also good pollinators. <laughs> Here, I've been bashing honeybees, and I feel a little bad, but not too bad. Uh, so what are honeybees good for? Well, honeybees are good at making honey, and a lot of it. Bumblebees also make honey, but they don't make enough for us to harvest. And wild bees, they live such a short amount of time that they just eat straight wildflower nectar. You see, all bees are vegetarians. The pollen is their protein source, and the nectar is their carbohydrate source. But the problem is how honeybees go about collecting the nectar and pollen. Honeybees' colonies, they're so large, and they're such good communicators that they can outstrip an area of pollen and nectar before the wild bees can fully take advantage. Thriving honeybee hives could be at the detriment to thriving wild bees. There are numerous studies showing that wild bees have been in decline, not only in North America with bumblebees, but several different bee species in Europe. Luckily, though, there are quite a few different things, easy things, that we can all do. Like, give bees shelter, right? Wild bees don't live in wooden hives like honeybees do. Instead, there are a lot of species, like the mason bee, that will live in hollow plant stems, or in the holes in driftwood, or even in old beetle tunnels in dead trees. So if you have a dead tree in your yard, consider just leaving it. And interestingly, 65% of our wild bees are all ground nesters. So leave some bare spots in your vegetable garden, in your flower beds, to give them a spot to live. Protect bees from pesticides, right? I hate ticks. I hate them with a vengeance, right? I've had Lyme disease five times. But what I do to protect myself from ticks is I spray myself, not the lawn. And it's awful when your lawn gets big brown spots in it from grubs. But instead of using chemicals to treat that, use beneficial nematodes. And give bees food. I mean, it makes sense, right? So plant clumps of native flowers, trees, shrubs in your backyard, your front yard, everywhere around. Even a planter box of flowers helps the cause. And how many of you have had reduced yields in your backyard garden or know somebody who has had reduced yields in the last few years? Yeah. The best thing you can do is plant dandelion and clover grow in your lawn. The local bees will then include your yard as part of their foraging routine, and then they'll be at the ready to pollinate all those things you have in your garden. Hands down, you'll get more vegetables next year doing this. So there are 4,000 bee species throughout the United States. In the Northeast alone, there's 450 different kinds. They work so hard to make our world look so beautiful. And on top of that, they feed us. So we should really return the favor. So plant a flower and take a bee to lunch. <laughs> Thank you so much.